I, I can't disagree with uh, your value, the point about evaluations. I'm coming here all the way from BC uh, because the show has grown. If you like folks like me coming out, you've got to tell them. They, they, you know, they're, I'm not being paid to be here, but they do cover my flight and hotel and things like that. So it's not like it's inexpensive to bring me over here. I'm happy to be here, but uh, it's only because of you folks wanted me. So my name is Richard Campbell. Thanks uh, so much for having me out. Um, actually, I can relate to Sweden because I'm from British Columbia, and it's that's not that different, right? We have fjords, and <laughs> we do. We have ocean. There's some mountains, and uh, and I'm probably in the only part of the world where you're just not that impressed by bears. Because when I show the bear clip in Australia, they lose their minds. Like they have every poisonous thing known to man, but. They don't have bears. Well, they got little bears, but not. This is a, a black bear. It's a, the male that lives in the area. He's about 300 kilos. This is Wednesday morning at my place. Wednesday is garbage day. So he's just coming to see if I put up my garbage early. He's very reliable. And I did, I, you know, you see them once in a while, but it wasn't until I put this camera in. We actually call this the, the animal highway because it's the, the forest is behind us here. They come through every Wednesday to make sure. They're very reliable. And if you were here a little earlier, you knew I was just running clip after clip of bears and raccoons and skunks, and that's just where we live. Uh, so uh, I'm an old programmer. I wrote my first line of code in 1977. Disturbing, isn't it? Uh, that's not the most important thing that happened in 1977. The most important thing is Star Wars. Right? That's the very first one back when it was just Star Wars, not A New Hope or Episode Four, just Star Wars. And hand shot first. And nobody was freaked out about that. It was okay. It was 1977. Um, the computer I was playing with back in that day was a TRS-80 Model 1. It was made by the Tandy Corporation. It had a whole 4K of RAM in it. And we stored programs on the cassette tape player. That's actually a modified RCA TV that probably is the reason I wear glasses today. Uh, and it had a version of BASIC in it uh, called a Tiny BASIC. It wasn't even a Microsoft BASIC. And it only had three error messages. What? <laughs> How? And sorry. <laughs> you type print divide one by zero, and it's like, sorry. <laughs> Which is kind of the best error message ever, right? It's a really honest error. I mean, what's, what's object not found, but sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, so I've worked in computing for a long time. I've done all kinds of different jobs. I mean, I, I was 10 years old in 1977. My first, quote, job job at 12 was repairing computers. Father's an electrical engineer. He taught me to solder from early days. I've really not done anything else. Uh, and if you have any idea who I am, you may know I make some podcasts. Any Donnet Rocks listeners in the room? Wow, OK, awesome. So Donnet Rocks was started by my friend Carl Franklin back in 2002, which predates the word podcast by three years which is why we call it the Internet Audio Talk Show, because he wasn't clever enough to come up with the word podcast. That was Adam Curry. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, th I'm actually the third co-host of .NET Rock. So I joined, I was a guest in 2004. I joined as the co-host on episode 100 in 2005. And previous to me, the two previous co-hosts had each done 50 shows. So I thought I'd do 50 shows. I mean, 50 shows, how hard could it be? So we're at 1,672 shows now, and uh, close. And uh, we'll record one here tomorrow at lunchtime. We're gonna we're gonna make one. So if you if you if you listen to the show, you want to see how the sausage is being made. Because listen, the show's pretty polished. We work hard to make it sound great. It doesn't start that way. We make it that way. So you can see how all of that's done. I also make Run As Radio, which is an IT oriented podcast. I kind of live in both worlds. And so I've been making that show since 2007. One episode a week, every Wednesday, since April of 2007. And for a brief interval, about three years, we made another show called The Tablet Show from 2011 to 2014. And that was a kind of a dark time for .NET. Do you remember like when the first build came along in WinJS and Windows 8, and Carl and I kind of walked out of that first com build conference going, wow, what if .NET doesn't rock? <laughs> this was our contingency plan, was a place to talk about tablet development, and, and if .NET was gonna have, not going to be important, then we had to do something. So anyway, it turned out Donnet rocks. And so we rolled that back into the main show. Uh, and they're all free to download. We, we sell advertising on them. That's how we, they get paid for. So no, no magic there. Listen on your commute. 
Now we're talking about development disruption. So, you know, I've made a couple of thousand podcasts, which really is me researching, talking to smart people about what's important and where they're going. And so this talk is really a composite of everything I've learned over the past few years to sort of set trajectories on different aspects of technology for us as developers. And we all developers in the room, mostly? Yeah, okay. Any non-developers? A couple of non, would you call yourself a manager? Or you just lost? Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, you're not gonna hold it against anybody, right? It's, uh, but from a development perspective, We've been working on some stuff, and it, we all talk about how hard it is to keep up. But believe me, it's kind of a calm time in technology. The, the, there's a few things on the horizon that are pretty profound that are going to significantly change stuff. So I, I'm going to talk about those pieces, and then we'll also spin that into, so what does this mean for us right now? Like, what can I do to help get ready? Right? How's that going to impact me? Because if, if you're living in the .NET space, like you're in a pretty good spot. They've done a good job of positioning for a bunch of potential disruption. Now, there's not a lot of debate about the significance of the cloud. Utility computing, or this idea of you know, a, a tap of compute available to you is, is pretty much come to pass. We're still in the early days of it. You know, I kind of equate this to when electricity was new, where we're not quite at the place where, you know, when electricity was first being created and introduced into cities and things, it wasn't going into people's homes. There was no outlets. Like, kind of the outlet is the last stage of evolution for electricity where it was now the concept of an appliance. We're not there with, with cloud. Cloud is no more in the early stages where we're primarily supplying factories, that we now have these data centers that you can use on demand, you know, per minute consumption. That's, it's progress without a doubt, and it's got a lot of potential, but we're still really learning what that's about. It's not a, the platform it could be. We're starting to see platformy pieces, things that just only make sense running in the cloud. And the big wave on that, the first sort of big product is going to be the AI product. And I show HAL for a reason. Uh, the first time, artificial intelligence is an old word. And it's a, it's a stupid phrase, actually, right? Uh, two things I have thoughts about whenever I look at a phrase like artificial intelligence. Like, first, reverse it. Like natural stupidity? I don't know. Uh, but also, the first time, the, you know, Marvin Minsky coined the term in the 1950s when he was pitching the idea that computing could take a lot of work off the back of the military. So he was getting funding from the military, called it artificial intelligence. It didn't really work, but you know. They, but the reason for HAL is that the movie 2001, a Space Odyssey, came out in 1968. And it was the first time the public heard the words artificial intelligence. And then it tried to kill everybody. So we kind of set the tone for our sort of sense of artificial intelligence 50 years ago. And we're still more or less trying to shake that off. It's not that impressive, actually. The best sort of taxonomical view I've ever seen of AI is this diagram. And it's tricky to read, actually. The length of the lines speaks to how new the technology is. So the shortest line here, the expert system, that's what Minsky developed back in the 19. Well, actually, the, the scheduling optimization, that's the technology developed in the 1950s, and then the sort of first AI winter came. After that, in the 70s, the expert systems and robotics, when stuff is sort of invading the factories and so forth, that's sort of the next wave of AI. And then the lines get longer. We got speech to text, text to speech in the 90s, but it wasn't that good back when you had to train your speech systems. And then the latest generation really come out of these adversarial networks and so forth that really start back in 2011. There are several different species of artificial intelligence. It's why it's so confusing. Right? There's, there's this pure sort of mathematical models, the machine learning models, and then there's the neural net stuff. And they're, they're distinctly different from each other. The original neural nets actually go all the way back to the 80s, and it literally was this model of three tiers that you have an input tier, you have what they call the hidden layer, and then you have an output tier. And these are logical constructs. In reality, you just had mathematical values stored in an array, and they would affect each other with a mathematical construct. Um, one of the guys who worked on this back in the, in the old days is a, a fellow by the name of Jeffrey Hinton. He's an Englishman, but he lives in Canada now. He's in the University of Toronto. And you know, he had a PhD in AI in 1977, when it definitely wasn't cool. Uh, but he had a lot of the good thinking around the potential of, uh, of the, the architectures well before the technology could take it on. 
and he studied neural nets in those early days. And he actually wrote a paper in the eight, in the late 80s where he said, listen, this is a mathematical way for us to do what they call back propagation, to assess the values of neurons and adjust them in a repeatable, efficient way that will get to a good learning model. But computationally, we don't have enough horsepower. We, we can't do this. It'll take forever. It doesn't run fast enough. And so the paper sort of sat on the shelf until uh, the early 2010s when a group of students sort of dust off the paper and say, can we build these convoluted networks today? So now the neural net is much larger, right? Many, as, a, as much as 10 tiers deep. And back propagation adjusts all those neurons. And so the actual comp, what they were doing was doing image recognition. So they'd take an image, like say of a number, they'd break it down into a matrix of black and white values. And that just becomes these values, right? So we've, we've turned an eight into just a series of zeros and different numbers that recognizes il illumination. And if you've ever seen when systems take photos and then turn them black and white in low resolution, it's because they're feeding into a system like this. It can't actually handle a tremendous amount of resolution of pixels, and it doesn't need to. Right? You can train this model quite successfully to consistently recognize various different kinds of eights. So this was the back propagation model as it began. And when you combine that with the availability of, of uh, the social media data, they had a lot of information to feed to it. And so there was a competition in the, late, in the early 2010s on image recognition that was using your typical decision tree models, the old school way of doing machine learning. And they were, this was 14 million images that were categorized, so they already knew exactly what was in every image. And so the contest was, can you write a piece of software that will identify each of those images, right? This is the Imaginate competition. And the best decision tree models were getting about 70% accuracy. And then Hinton's students wrote, uh, for the 2012 competition, the competition had already been running for a couple of years, wrote the first sort of adversarial network AI using neural nets to train against those models. And then they ran it and got 80%, 85% the first try, and 100% the second try. If you remember back to those early 2010s, so you know, seven, eight years ago, that's when all the Siri and all that voice recognition stuff suddenly came out and you didn't need to train it anymore. Like it just kind of worked, unless you were Australian. Uh, that was from this contest. It was the Googles and the Apples and the Microsofts of the world that immediately hired all those students and put them to work using this new neural mo model to do image recognition and, and speech recognition. It just represented this jump that we're still dealing with today. Um, Hinton is convinced that we're coming into another uh, AI winter, but it's because he's a scientist who thinks in terms of, are we actually advancing the science? And, it's, and the reality is most of us are actually engineers who take the science, apply it, and then just keep applying it. And the, the adversarial network model, game model, works pretty well. It's consistent, good enough. And it is all that access to all this data that's making it work. You know, normally, as programmers, we have a set of inputs, and then we code a group of rules to get to the outputs that we desire. All right? This is how programming has worked for decades. These learning models, instead of writing the rules, we have the machine learn the rules. We have a set of inputs, and we had a set of outputs. We know an intended set of outputs, what we call the, the training model. We feed it to the software. It figures out the rules. The problem is that it figures out the rules in a way that's hard for us to understand and to know why it goes wrong. And so we're struggling with understanding that. But the key to that model is tremendous amounts of data. Now you combine that with what's gone on with social media where most of humanity that has access to the internet is willingly feeding a tremendous amount of information on to the internet and mostly to websites who quite categorically say, when you send us a picture, we can do whatever the heck we want with it. And we are, right? And one of the things they're doing is feeding into these AI models, doing different kinds of trainings, learning more about how to understand data. How well, you know, this is why facial recognition works as well as it does. And at the same time, we're starting to have that lash back finally. You know, the car came before the driver's license. 
for a long time, you know, car ownership was for the wealthy. It was an unusual thing to do. It was novel and vague. And then they became more popular and less expensive and more people used them and people started getting killed. And sociologically in society, we said, hey, there should be some rules, right? And that's when you get traffic lights and road lines and driver's licenses. And I think we're kind of there with social media. This is not a popular opinion in America. Those guys are crazy, okay? But in you know, other countries in the West, and remember I'm from Canada, we are far more convinced of the idea that this has become important enough and large enough in society that maybe there should be some rules. And so you're starting to see our governments our, and us as technology experts trying to develop those rules in meaningful ways. And part of this is around privacy. We certainly can talk, talk about the, GP, uh, the GPDR in that perspective. Uh, anybody remember this guy? Sir Tim Berners-Lee, right? Kind of invented the web. He didn't invent the internet, he invented the web. He was a, he was a young uh, developer at CERN, so not a physicist, but like a software engineer. And, and he realized that, that communicating documents on the internet would be really useful. He was specifically thinking about scientific papers, so this whole idea of all your references were linkable and you can get to the next one. That, that was his essential thought. Porn came later, right? And if you go to, if you get a chance to go to CERN, the original web server and web browser, like the very first one, is a Next computer in a little piece of plexiglass covered. It has a sticker on it that says, server, do not turn off. But yeah, that's, you know, he started all of this. And he has a new project, and it's specifically around privacy. And the organization is called Inrupt, and they're making a thing called Solid. The core concept is that your personal information stays yours and that you create these user pods, essentially what information you're willing to share with an organization, but it'll, for a limited amount of time. So imagine rather than filling in a form for an e-commerce transaction, you basically give them a pod, which is the address information they need and maybe credit card information to be able to do a transaction, but it only lasts for 30 days. So they can complete the transaction with you and they only have the rights to that information till the 30 days goes up. It's an interesting idea you know, anybody in e-commerce is not motivated to do this, right? This is something that has to come from us, but it's TBL. I mean, he did make the web, so we love him. He also came up with XML, so I'm not so sure if we love him that much. But he's trying. He's at least presenting an idea of an approach. We could try and manage this more. And I think it's certainly incumbent on all of us as developers working in this world to sort of think in terms of the impact we have on privacy. And this idea of do we really need this data, right? No, I'm a, I've always been big as a developer on not owning the keys to the production servers because then it would be my fault, right? I'll, you know, give me the logs from there, but I can't. I don't want to be able to actually access the machine directly. It just makes your life easier. Let somebody else worry about that. And then same thing here. What if we didn't retain this information because we don't actually need it after we completed the transaction? Uh, other things that are concerning us around AI, uh, maybe you've seen this, is from 2017. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything you know at is? any point in time. Uh, Even if they the would never fake? say those this things. This is the original deepfake. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, 2017. see, I would never say these things, today. at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. What's funny about this is you're wondering Moving why forward, Jordan is emulating We need to be more Obama, vigilant right? with what we it's trust from the, the internet. Around. And it's a time when we need to rely on now, trusted news Now, if you've seen sources. this one, did you ever see this one? Dear people of Belgium, this is a huge deal. As you know, I had the balls to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement, and so should you, because what you guys are doing right now in Belgium is actually worse. You agreed, but you're not taking any measures. So do you know Only the story behind blah, this one? It's blah, hilarious. Bing, bang, boom. This, of course, is terrible. It's poorly done, deep face, right? Like This is done with an adversarial network. This is using the same technology we do for voice recognition, image recognition, and so forth. And what they're doing is they take uh, a certain amount of video footage of the subject and uh, 
feed it into a network so that it knows all of the sort of expressions and things that they would do. And then literally somebody voices the, what they want them to say and the software makes the mouth move and the face move. All right? And this is now three years old, so it's only gotten better. In 2018, an environmental uh, advocacy group in Belgium, who was very concerned with the Belgian government not following the Paris Accords, had this made, and it's a very poor quality, where President Trump is basically telling them, like, don't, you should pull out of the Paris Accords, right? Because you're not following it anyway, what's the point? And people just believed it, right? It even says in it, this is a fake, <laughs> right? We're trying to protest, but, you know, that's not what happened. And they actually, you know, they, it became a whole, they certainly put focus on the, the issue of the Paris Accords, but at the same time also brought forward the fact that people aren't paying close enough attention to realize when fake stuff like this is being made. What if it was actually a good one? This wasn't, but good deep fakes are good enough now that it takes another AI to actually recognize that it's a fake. There's certain blurring behaviors and so forth which are hard for our eyes to see, but the software can pick it up. So we're kind of in an arms race now that video is no longer any more believable than audio, right? And meantime, audio has actually advanced a lot now. Uh, maybe you, saw, you may have seen this demonstration that Microsoft made just, just last year, where it takes about 30 minutes of your spoken words, learns your pitches, and then real-time translates you into other language. So Julia White demonstrated this by doing a presentation that was being voiced in Japanese in her voice, as if she was speaking Japanese. So, we've got some pretty cool technology in front of us. You like the technology part. But we do have a lot of folks that are trying to manage this, that we are in an interesting time, that we are you know, challenged by this. So the, the partnership on AI, all the big players here, the reality, of course, is most AI models depend on the cloud. That's why I sort of led with, we've got cloud, this is sort of the first product of cloud. When it comes to training significant models, you need uh, the horsepower of the cloud. Operating the model will work in almost anything. Even a phone is enough compute power to take a, a, a developed model and keep going. I mean, it makes me worry about what Snapchat's going to become. You mix deep fake technology with Instagram, and now you've got anybody saying almost anything for fun, right? Or, you know, I could make office video chat so much more interesting if I can just replace everybody's faces. Uh, so the big players are trying, trying to figure this out. The gatekeepers around the cloud may be an aspect of managing that. But it's certainly going to have an impact on us as developers. Just to think in the ethics of the technologies that we're using. You know, our, our employers are going to ask us to use this stuff and to do good things with it, you know, valuable things for the organization. You just have to think hard about it. Uh, the organization uh, FATE, or the Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics in AI, this is, uh, was originally put together by Microsoft, but it's out of New York. And this is a group of folks who are, the big thing they're focused on is we're using this a lot of data that's available publicly now that represents strong bias. So a lot of image recognition that you know struggles with dark skin, right? Or accents that don't make sense, or the fact that you know, they don't understand Swedish. Right? It's all part of, we should level it. We don't just use data sets without understanding the biases that exist. There are always biases, right? Essentially, that's what machine learning works from. That's normal. You just need to know what they are. So that as it presents ideas, as it presents potential solutions, you reflect on the bias that the solution presents. Say, is this actually what we want to do? Does this make sense? Uh, the DARPA group, this is, a, the mil this is a military intelligence group, is working hard on explainable AI. Actually, you see this catchphrase a lot, where in these typical learning models, we're able to show it an image that tells us it's a cat, but it doesn't tell us why it knows it's a cat. And it's not a big deal when it gets it right, it's a big deal when it gets it wrong. Right? I showed you 100 cats, and you said 99 of them are cats, and one of them you said it's not a cat. Why? And so the explainable AI model talks about changing the way we do training so that we can actually see when learning models get stuff wrong. And so this is kind of the edge in 2020 of where we are. We still don't really know how this thing we've made works well enough to say why it, why it won't work on something, why it will struggle with something. 
Uh, if you're gonna, we talk about disruptions in development, this area is the new area and it has significant consequences. It's not a panacea, it's not magic, but it does things that are harder to understand and there are good tools for us to work with it. All right, let's change subjects a little bit, something a little lighter hearted like the end of Moore's Law. So we all have heard the phrase Moore's Law, we know what we're talking about amongst my people, right? This Moore's Law thing. Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel back in the 1960s, he was actually working with a company called Fairchild Semiconductor, which you may not know as well, but they're the guys who brought you precision-guided ICBMs. The original product for integrated circuits and microcomputers was nuclear bombs. Hooray. Uh, and he was the one who saw the one of the people who saw the huge potential of that technology and helped found what we now know as the Silicon Valley. And one of his insights was that for a given amount of money, say $1,000, they could advance the technology for manufacturing integrated circuits to double the number of transistors over the same amount of area for the same amount of money. That's all he said. He didn't call it a law because it's not a law. Gravity's a law, as in you don't need to believe it for it to happen. Right? The actual ability to double transistor density means a lot of work by a lot of people. However, somebody else decided to call it a law, and large groups of people and tremendous amounts of money have kept that true right up till around now. So for the past 60 or so year, we've had this progression. Original Intel 4004, the first four-bit microcomputer made by Intel back in 1970, all the way up to almost today. And we've had this very nice line. Now this is only a nice line because it's an exponential uh, y-axis, right? We're going up by orders of magnitude on the y-axis. That's why it gives us that line. If we were doing a normal progression, it would look more like this, right? what they call the hockey stick, where if we're just going up regular numbers, none of these CPUs are relevant, and only the last ones are kind of cool. So that's why we put the exponential graph on there, because we like that line, it makes more sense. And humans have a prime understanding exponents, but just how much more it is for each generation. But Moore's Law is ending. Now, why? We've threatened this before. Why do we think Moore's Law is ending? Well, you know, we're, we're running out of space. Actually, here's an example I use for folks who are less technical about what we mean by Moore's Law, right? Everyone seen one of these? The warp drive for the enterprise? No, no, that's the warp drive for an enterprise. This is a Cray XMP supercomputer, circa 1985. This was the most powerful computer in the world in its day. In 1985, this was uh, you know, $16 million. It had 1.9 gigaflops of compute power. Right? So that's uh, trillions of or billions of computing operations per second. They modeled nuclear explosions off this thing. They helped do orbital trajectory calculations. There was only a few hundred of them in the world, mostly universities, 1.9 gigaflops. 1985, 2011, iPad 2, 800 bucks, 1.9 gigaflops. And you play Candy Crush on it. But that's my best example for Moore's Law, right? Is in a period of 26 years, we went from the most powerful computer ever made and, you know, meant basically, you know, treated like it's in a temple with people in white lab coats to a thing you had a three-year-old. Right? That they then try and stretch the pictures. And that joke course, this is 2011, that's not fast. When you talk about fast, right, for, for a personal computer, the beast would be uh, like a current generation video card. This is an RTX 2080 by, uh, by NVIDIA for about a thousand bucks if you can find one because the Bitcoin miners are buying them all. 13.4 teraflops. So, 7,000 times faster than the iPad 2. And that's still just commercial grade stuff I can buy at the local electronics shop, right? Maybe a little bit high end. When you talk about the leading edge of computers today, you talk about the current generation supercomputers. This is the IBM uh, AC922. So there's a duel between China and America about who can build the largest supercomputer. This is 122 petaflops also consumes nine megawatts of electricity, so bring your own nuclear reactor. 
um, 9,000 times faster than the video card, 64 million times faster than the iPad. Uh, we figure the human brain runs somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 petaflops. So this is five of those. But software lags behind hardware. So we have a lot of compute in our horizon. If you think in terms of a Cray supercomputer 1980s becomes a retail commercial device we hand to children, now look at today's supercomputer and say, is this what we're going to have in whatever the computing form factor looks like? 10, 20 years from now. But we are running against Moore's law ending, right? We keep that doubling going, and eventually, we're actually slowing down right now. Intel's starting to struggle to maintain that arc the same way. And the reason is simple. They're running out of atoms. So today, we're talking about five nanometer technology, OK? They've all, they always use these different phrases when they're describing the, the, the CPUs you were buying. You know, they, were, they started out at, at 85 nanometer, and then they, they go down a little, a little bit more, and a little bit more. And the sort of current generation of stuff that's in this laptop is 10 nanometer. And five is the, the kind of leading edge. Now, how small is a nanometer? Like, again, we get back to this problem of humans just can't grapple with what's a nanometer. It's a billionth of a meter. Billion's just too big of a number. Here's my favorite description. If I ask you to wait for a million seconds, just a million seconds, how long am I asking you to wait for? It's like 11 and a half days. Just sit there, count. So now let's ask you to wait for a billion seconds. Now how long am I asking you to wait for? 34 years. So a nanometer is to a meter, as a second is to 34 years. It's a billion. There are a lot of nanometers in a meter. And when you talk about your average 400 millimeter wafer, where they're cramming 6 billion transistors in, it's because they make them this small. And the limit is how wide a silicon atom is. Right? We make all this stuff out of silicon. And a silicon atom is 111 picometers across, or 0.1 nanometers. So when you're talking about 5 nanometer process, you're talking about 40 atoms per transistor across. This is a, an electron tunneling microscope of the actual atomic structure of a silicon wafer, which is almost completely pure. Those dents in it are actually how they make transistors work. It's not just pure silicon. It's also doped with arsenic on one layer and doped with phosphorus on the other. And so sometimes there's high bumps and sometimes there's low holes. And the doping ratio is roughly 1 in 10. So you're 40 atoms across, 39 of them, or 36 of them should be silicon atoms, and four of them should be boron on the P layer if you get it right. If you don't, it doesn't work. It's just too precise, right? Like we're kind of we're running out of atoms. It's small. There is a, a physical limit. So, and it's You'll also hear folks, you know, magazine articles and things, with they've, we've made a transistor out of one phosphorus atom. Yeah, but you made one of them. I need several billion per product that I'm selling. And I still like to make it roughly about $1,000 a copy, right? Your top tier processor year over year has been about a grand the whole time. And so even though we kept going denser and denser and denser, so it's one thing to make one. It's another thing to make billions and billions and billions cheaply and reliably. So that's kind of the line that we're at. So what's going to change as Moore's Law stops? Well, Moore's Law is also a punishment. And not only is it the hard work to get there, but it's that we're also hitting the, uh, we've ignored a whole lot of other things. If you're an engineering team and you're trying to figure out what you want to work on next to improve your computer, if your improvement doesn't represent essentially a doubling of computing potential in the next 18 to 24 months, don't do it. Wait for the processor, because the processor will give you the bigger returns. And so we've not fixed a lot of things architecturally in, in computing for a long time. We've been more or less doing the same thing over and over again. We're starting to see architectural battles inside of the CPU. So this is one of the Intel architectures. 
and this is an ARM architecture. So this is redesigning the CPU. Now, does this affect us as developers? Largely, no, and we have companies like Microsoft to thank for this. We've had many different generations of many different kinds of processors for years and years and years, and you just got to compile .NET and it worked. Right? The just-in-time compiler side effect is it only decides exactly the instructions it needs to feed to the CPU at the point of execution. What CPU have I got? Okay. For the brief time that Microsoft was serious about ARM in that WinRT stage, there was a compiled ARM option in .NET. Right? We've, we've always had that ability. So we li if you're living in the .NET world right now, where you, you're able to use that compiler, you don't actually have to worry that much about these hardware changes. It's going to mostly do it for you. The other aspect that's going to come is more specialization in CPUs. This general CPU design is based on it's the only computing device in the machine. That's simply not true anymore. We have GPUs, right? Our video cards are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. They are scalar computers. That's why the Bitcoin miners like them so much. And there's also FPGAs, right? Programmable arrays. And so we're able to now have dedicated computing devices for different work. How is that going to impact you? In a lot of ways, not. If you stick with the current versions of the framework, you're going to see the framework now learn, realize what computing resources it have, recognize different pieces of your program, and execute them on different stacks. So we're being isolated from this. But it sort of depends on the kind of work you're doing. C++ program is about to get really complicated. Not that it wasn't already, but at low-level software development, you look at scale your compute methodologies, it's challenging. They're complicated libraries, and it's only going to get more advanced. And you throw the cloud into this equation where it's like, and we don't need to own these things anymore. Right? It's, it's Microsoft or Amazon's problem to buy this new hardware and put it into harnesses so that our code can execute on demand. It's part of what's going to make a lot of this feasible for us, is that we're, we're largely able to cope. And we're going to be able to play with new form factors. Ever, anyone ever laid hands on one of these machines? This is the, stu the Surface Studio device. The computer's OK, but the screen's magic, right? And it actually lays down and so forth. Like, I'd love to lay hands on one of those. But we are you know, tinkering new form factors. I'm not used to Microsoft making good looking computers. It's weird, but you know, that's one of them. You know, most of us are living in laptop land. That's still the principal machine. Desktops are, how many folks still have a desktop machine? Yeah, a few. Yeah, I think software developers have more than most because we tend to have more com need more compute, more flexibility. But of course, the reality is most of the software we're building today isn't running on the machines that we use. Right? I mean, for a long time as a developer, you were pretty much coding on exactly the same machine that your user was going to work on. And then the phone took over. And programming on a phone sucks. So now we're working on bigger format machines to run on smaller format machines. And that cycle time is that much harder. Right? The dominance of the mobile device is, is hard to argue with. Right? And it's all this thing's fault. I mean, this wasn't that good of a phone in 2007. It really wasn't. Like, Bomber wasn't wrong to make fun of this one. And also, I mean, phones got sad after this. Before the iPhone, remember, phones were kind of cool. You know, we had different antennas, we had slide-out keyboards, and like, you, you could have some choice. After the iPhone, just a slab of black glass. Everything's a slab of black glass. But what's really happened with the phone? If you think from 2007 to today, there's about 4 billion of these in operation right now. That pretty much represents every adult human on the planet. If they have access to bandwidth and the financial means, although the cost of the basic smartphones drop so low, it's like less than a month's salary even in the least developed nations, you have a smartphone. And so suddenly we have all this compute available to us, inf the incredible communication capability, most of the adult human race and a non-trivial number of the children, we're all cyborgs now. We all have electronic extensions to ourselves, right? Cyborg seems like a funny word, right? And you, you, you think science fiction, but electronic extension of yourself. You look how emotional people get when they forget it or lose it or drop it, right? We just keep it on the outside of the body. That's all, because, ew. And also makes it harder to upgrade. And you always want a new one anyway. But we're at saturation, more or less, right? Smartphone sales are finally tapering off. They're leveling off to replacement levels, the same way the PC leveled off from replacement level. P PC sales, it's 2011, about 350 million. And then it started declining. 
But last year was the first year it sort of leveled off at about 250 million, which is sort of replacement level. PC also including laptops. So we're replacement levels now with these things. We're starting to get that way with the phones. There's more phones. But it hints to an idea that this is about to be disrupted. The smartphone has run its course, more or less. I mean, how many cameras do you need on the back of your phone? Okay. We're kind of doing the same thing, right? All right, the screen's going to be a little bit bigger, a little bit rounder, a little bit smaller. You know, it's just we're fussing around. We're groping for the replacement. And this is a conversation about how this is going to impact us as developers. Think about the impact that the smartphone had on development. It has fundamentally changed us, right? Most of us now are building on one machine to deploy to something completely different. And that's only been a few years. It's likely to happen again. My best guess, everything that I've researched, is the replacement for the smartphone is the smart visor. Now, right now, our visors aren't all that smart. But there are a bunch of them. And it's usually a sign that we're groping around for a new idea, right? We've heard about the Magic Leap. Certainly, the new HoloLens is an impressive device. There's some others here that are mostly in the industrial space. I actually am comparing the state of the, the visor to the 1990s and smartphones. So the BlackBerry. We're in the BlackBerry era right now. We're, we're at the beginning of the BlackBerry era. Because BlackBerry was an expensive device for its time, and it required a lot of infrastructure to make it useful. And so only enterprises could reasonably operate it. And so when you start looking at some of the commercial applications, for a visor system like this, it's that ability to augment reality. So one of the best demonstrations I've seen of this is that they're wearing, the, uh, as a technician, being able to see through hardware and to see the checklist for the correct disassembly. But more importantly, the visor's able to see that he's following the steps. So he doesn't just say, step one is this, and then step two is that. It's a step one is this, now do it, remove all the screws. Until the screws are removed, and the system can actually see they've removed them, you don't get step two. So enforce safety procedures. One of the cooler tricks you've seen, this was a Boeing demonstration where there's a fellow working on the landing gear assembly on an aircraft, and he gets to the point where they think they've got the problem part, and he can't really determine what the problem is on the part, and so he phones for an expert. And the headset basically rings to a person in a different city, in a maintenance yard. That guy puts on his visor and sees through the technician's eyes literally at what he's looking at, and gives him a couple of hints and goes, yeah, that's the part. OK, get a replacement for it. This is a kind of new workflow, right? We have this schism now that we're going to have to support with technology, where we have generalist workers that are almost going to have to continuously retrain on different tasks as we automate and modify jobs. And then we have expert workers, of which there are too few and need to be used efficiently. And this is a technology that bridges those two. That the, le that the generalized worker is continuously being trained by information being presented to them as they do their work, and then can invoke the expert when needed. And that's going to take a lot of software to make all that work. We're getting there with the hardware. This is a HoloLens 2 mounted to a safety helmet, right? The, ba the computing pack is in and batteries in the back screen on the front. Right? This is a real product, not a mock-up. The device is insanely complex. This is Moore's law in action, that we have densified the technology to the point where everything is self-contained on the head, requires no tethering, no wires, able to work a reasonable length of a day with that kind of information available to you. It's still not a consumer product. We still don't really know what the consumer product will be. I don't think it'll have to wait till it's invisible, because these were never invisible. Once upon a time, walking around like this was not socially acceptable, right? That we sat at lunch, you know, my, my, my daughter's got smartphone. I had the smartphone first, of course, right, gadgety one. My, once the iPhone came along, the kids both wanted them. They were teenagers, so got them both iPhones and suddenly have a problem at dinner, right? Kids are always on the phone. My wife's like, we, you know, we got to make a rule. We got to get rid of smartphones at dinner. So I was like, before we do that, and I got her a smartphone, then everything was fine. We made a social construct change, right? If it's compelling enough, they'll take it on. Like People are like, we're not going to use the visor. It looks ridiculous, right? I don't want to be a glass hole. I've had a Google Glass. I have a Google Glass. I just don't wear it anymore. It doesn't do much. 
But in the first days when I had it, and I actually wore it outside, people weren't repelled by it. What they said is, can I try it? And then after they found the experience not compelling, then they came up with reasons why you shouldn't have it. Right? The, what made the smartphone work was when someone said, can I try it? You couldn't get it back from them. They got enamored of it. When the goggles are good enough, they'll take over by storm. Now, we're going to end up doing creepy things with it. Right? Don't mention swirls. Swirls. That's okay. But that, you know, you think about, we're freaking out about recogni facial recognition. What happens when we're wearing a piece of gear that'll just facially recognize everybody all the time? You know, that's not creepy at all. Right now, it may be, but funny how social contracts change. The experience is compelling enough. Right? We're going to be in the middle of this as software developers. This hardware happens the next few years, right? We already see the early versions. William Gibson says, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So, you know, I get the opportunity to go in and talk to folks like Boeing and so forth that are using this thing at the edge and experimenting with this to make my people more productive, more capable, and so forth. And then we start just extrapolating to, you know, environments we might use it in. And so, you know, once upon a time, this was socially unacceptable. Now it's lunch, right? And the visor could absolutely go that way. Now, what could it do for us that's different from the phone? Well, walking into traffic, not paying attention is less likely. Actually, the power of the goggle is that it's on your face. It is like a dash cam for your head, which means it's always paying attention. It'll tell you to not walk into traffic. You say, I mean, I'm not saying any of us are going to pay any more attention. Okay, arguably, we'll pay less, right? But there'll be a device that is always paying attention. So imagine, you know, the power of a dash cam. I don't know if anybody has one. You know, they, they're putting a camera into your car. I've had one on the last two cars that I've had over the past, like, six years or so. And on two different occasions now, I've been witness to an accident, or rather the camera's been witness to an accident, and I take the SD card out of it, and I just give it to the fellow who's in the accident. It's like, hey, here's an HD video of your crash. Enjoy. But anyway, we have, at least we have a cop, and SD cards are cheap, right? Like, that's just a good gesture, and I'm all for karma. Give the guy the card, go get another card. Right? It's just, then you don't have to stick around, like, you're good. But it speaks to the point. You know, already we're seeing, and I'm sure you hear this on the radio too, where, you know, there was an incident at such and such an intersection on this date. If you have dash cam footage from this time, police would like to have it. Right? I mean, that's happening now. What happens when we have a dash cam on everybody's head? How about a negotiating a contract? Two people in an office, you know, debating through a contract, figuring out the terms for it, and the contract itself is the video recordings of them facing each other and shaking hands. What if we meet on the street and you're like, hey, there's this restaurant, it, you'll really like it, it's around the corner there, and the agent in the software just makes a record of it for us. We don't have to remember things. So later on that day, I'm like, what was that restaurant that that guy mentioned? We have a record of it. Like, it's interesting to just think of this agent we've always wanted, right? We've, we've kind of expected this thing to do it, right? That, that it would remember what to do and what to go on, but it's always in our pocket. And so it misses a lot of stuff. What if it wasn't? What if it was always out collecting data on our behalf? Now we get into that privacy problem again. And I don't, you know, we kind of have to live with the fact that we're going to collect the data. The real issue is what you are allowed to do with it. You know, how, what privacy looks like in that sense. The right to be forgotten and the right to not have your data used again without your permission. Right? So those are all part of this evolving landscape that we're headed towards. And if that weirds you out, like, don't worry, it's going to get worse. Like, stuff gets weirder from here. Technologically, from a programmer's perspective, the, you know, what are the logical tools for making a, programming a HoloLens? Right now, the most popular library for HoloLens is Unity. So you know C-sharp? Good for you. And three-dimensional objects, if you get a little lower level, there's a lot of XAML going on, too. XAML's got a, an innate ability to work in three dimensions. And so a lot of that three-dimensional camera work, it's just software we can understand. So we're in a good place to make a lot of this technology work. Uh, I have seen folks that are now getting circuits printed directly on their skin, because who doesn't want to plug themselves into USB? Uh, well, I think we're getting cheap enough manufacturing that it might just be part of our clothing, too, and it'll last 10 washes, and then you'll just get another one. 
or replace it. Uh, if you, there are experimental contact lenses now where they're actually drawing pixels directly on the eye, powered by, uh, by RF. So the edge of this is still continuing on. It may not be a visor eventually. Cool? Yeah. That's nothing wrong with sticking a computer in your eye. What's the big deal? And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention quantum computing at least. Um, it's overhyped, but then most things are. Uh, the whole encryption thing, that's what most people focus on, is almost meaningless. Uh, I don't need to explain quantum computers for, for you per se. It's a lot of words that doesn't really matter a lot to folks. Certain classes of algorithms run more effectively in a quantum model. Most of those algorithms don't involve like Candy Crush, right? Like they're, they're, they're not important in that respect. We are still in very early days. These are very unstable machines. The best description I have of them is, is exactly like what mainframes looked like in the 1940s, where each computer was essentially bespoke. You were building unique machines where the way you created bits depended on a given implementation. Some of them were electrical mechanical, some of them were vacuum tube based. Before the germanium transistor, took over. We don't have a consistent concept of a qubit, right? There are many different models of qubits. It's just like the early mainframes and every computer is a unique, special, unreliable flower. It's not smartphone technology by any stretch of the imagination. And we don't have problems relevant to the consumer directly. We have large scale problems. And again, the mainframe suits us this very well. This is when I, you know, IBM, who was making mainframes, says we've maybe a market for eight of these in the world. Quantum computers are kind of in that class, but not about breaking cryptography. If you want a really unique, useful, hard to solve problem, look at something like agriculture. Where quantum computing is going to make a huge difference is in chemistry, actually. 2% of the power consumption of this planet is put into fertilizers, right? We make huge amounts of ammonia, essentially, to make fertilizers. And we do that with the uh, Fischer-Tropsch process, great big, powerful, originally developed in Germany, or the Haber-Fosch pro process, originally developed in World War I to make explosives, because yay military, also happens to make fertilizer and changed everything that we were able to make so much. But we also have natural ways to make fertilizers, too, or to make ammonia. Bean plants, if you do crop rotation, you grow grain. If you try and grow grain in the same location the next year, it doesn't grow as well because you've stripped a lot of the nitrogen out of the soil. But there are some plants that put nitrogen back into the soil, and bean plants are one of them. On the roots of a bean plant are a particular kind of enzyme called the nitrogenase enzyme. It lives inside a bacteria, and it makes nitrogen uh, fixation, or ammonia essentially, right out of the air, water and air, quietly. It always has, right? And so the reason, the way you rejuvenate soil is you grow a crop of beans, you harvest the beans, you plow the plants under, you've added nitrogen to the soil, grow wheat better the next year. That's thousands of years of agriculture, but it means an entire season lost to a bean crop you may or not have wanted. We made commercial fertilizer, and now you grow wheat, you clear it out, you soak it in fertilizer, and you grow wheat again. But it has consequences. What if we could reproduce the bean behavior? Now, to do that, we have to understand the nitrogenase enzyme. And the nitrogenase enzyme has a catalytic reaction between iron and molybdenum that allows nitrogen and hydrogen to be combined with almost no energy involved, plant-level energies. We've known about this enzyme for 100 years. We can't figure out how it works. To, do, to actually figure it out at a molecular level, we need to be able to figure out all the interactions about 150 electrons. This is a quantum problem. 180 qubit quantum computer could solve this in about an hour. We're at 53 qubits right now when you talk about the most powerful process we've made so far. This is one uh, catalytic reaction. Solve this one, and you can make fertilizer out of air. Build a small device that runs on a watch battery that you can stick in the ground at any plant, make as much fertilizer as it needs on demand. We only have to solve this problem once. It's a good problem to solve. You want to figure out why would we use quantum computers? This is a good one. There's several hundred quantum chemistry problems like this we could be solving. Right? Battery technology, same thing. We've been hacking batteries forever. 
We know how batteries work. We don't know why batteries work the way we do. We literally are doing alchemy. We mix a few other chemicals and we try it again. That's why battery progress is so slow, because we don't actually know the fundamentals of how battery interaction work. Quantum problem. Superconductors. We figured out low temperature superconductor, high temperature superconductors. We still don't actually know why they work. Quantum problem. So there's a whole host of potential solutions there for this. If it interests you, this is good work. A couple calls to action and then we'll stop. First, uh, take a little time for yourself, the work you want to do to learn these new things. Sort of get a spectrum of where it is. A lot of the work you're already doing is going to be great, especially if you're living in the .NET world, but be on the new bits. right? Moving to core, that kind of thing, they're all part of that. Communicating with others around that technology will help you know what's coming, what you can work on. Uh, time for individual leadership, taking care of yourself. Uh, I hope this was a very useful learning space. I'm a big believer in reading. Learn how you learn, but put it on your schedule. The only thing on your schedule is taking out the garbage and what other people want you to do. Like you're not doing yourself any service. Block out time to read. And uh, think about the roles you have in an organization. And one last thing, hunting sacred cows. I don't have a bad thing about cows. Here's what I talk about when I hunt sacred cows. Stuff you think you know is true, but it doesn't actually happen to be true. My best example of that is this. What is this? This is a Mercator projection map. It's in every school. It's what you learn from. It's also wrong, badly wrong, right? This is a Peter's projection map. It's area ruled. It's correct. Africa is the right size. Greenland's the right size. It looks wrong. This looks right and is wrong. This is right and looks wrong. That's a sacred cow, right? That's, it's this politest thing the way we approach this. Think more broadly about these problems. And last but not least, if you really want to know what's, not, what's next, is make the future. We're in this. We design these things. You want to know what the future looks like? It's what we decide to make. Thanks so much for your time.